Welcome to Worship for August 22nd, 2021. My name is John Hagman, pastor at First Presbyterian Church here in Morganton, North Carolina. We're so glad that you've chosen to worship with us this week. You know, our online faith community is an important part of our ministry here at FPC Morganton. We want to connect and get to know you and walk alongside you in your journey of faith. So if you would, please consider taking a moment to follow the link at the bottom of your screen to our website and click the button, Connect With Us. We'd love to hear from you and learn how we can get to know you. Whether you're joining us online or in person, thank you so much for being part of our community of faith here. We have some important announcements we want to share with you about the events coming up in our church. So let's take a few minutes for this quick video. Hi, my name is Lindsay Volley, and I want to take a couple of minutes to share with you some of the announcements happening here at FPC Morganton. This past week, our church leadership group met and made the decision that we are going to implement a mask mandate starting now until further notice. And that will be anytime you come into the church facility for a meeting or to come to the office or for worship. If you would just have your mask candy and we feel like that is the best way that we can love our neighbors and show our love for our community. On Thursday the 26th, that, that's this week at 2 p.m., we will have a ribbon cutting event in our fellowship hall. We'll show off some of the upgrades to our facility and get ready for our praise and worship service, which is starting this Saturday at 6 p.m. We will have Hot Shots Coffee out in the parking lot at five o'clock. So come out early, have a cup of coffee with us, and then join us for our brand new praise and worship service starting at 6 p.m. in Fellowship Hall. Church, I hope that you have a great week and that you're blessed by the service today. Today, we wrap up our sermon series titled Faith Foundations. Paul's letter to the Ephesians lays a firm foundation for the Christian faith. Not only is the gospel of Jesus Christ good news, it invites everyone to embrace a new identity that impacts every aspect of life. Our allegiances, the choices we make, the relationships we keep and maintain with God and with others. Faith in Christ provides a firm foundation for godly living and places those brave enough to follow on the path towards wisdom. Our sermon series will explore these foundations and see how they impact our lives today. And so I pray that you've been blessed by this study of Ephesians as we wrap it up today. Friends, let's be called into worship using the words of Psalm 34. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord rescues them from them all. He keeps all their bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil brings death to the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Merciful God, you give life and overcome death. You know our anguish, not from afar, but in the suffering of Jesus Christ. Take all our grieving, our sorrow, all of our pain and tears, and heal us for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. So church, let's praise God together as we lift our voices together in song. Oh. 
Friends, our first reading for today comes from Joshua chapter 24, verses 1 through 2, and then we'll skip on over to 18 through 24. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors Terah and his sons Abraham and Nahor lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. But Joshua said to the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourselves, that you have chosen the Lord to serve Him. And they all said, We are witnesses. And so Joshua said, Then put away the foreign gods that are among you, and incline your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, The Lord our God, we will serve, and Him we will obey. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The same God that heard and redeemed the people of Israel is listening and heeding prayers from you and me today. When we come into the holy presence of God, our own humanity is laid bare for all to see. When we stand in the living presence of truth, our own falsehoods are revealed. So people of God, let us acknowledge who we are and ask our ever-present God to forgive us. We will confess together using the prayer on your screen, followed by a brief moment of silence for our own personal prayers. And so, church, together, let us pray. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our sinfulness, our shortcomings, and our offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, and forgetting your love. Have mercy on us, O Lord, for we are ashamed and sorry for all we have done to displease you. Forgive our sins and help us to live in your light and walk in your ways for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so God, hear now the prayers that we lift to you in the silence of our hearts. The psalmist writes that none who take refuge in the Lord will be condemned. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and rescues them from all their troubles. Friends, hear the good news. Because of God's love and mercy through Christ, your sins and mine have been forgiven. Thanks be to God. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the Amen. 
Since we have been forgiven in Christ, let us also forgive one another. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. A few years ago, I was serving at a wonderful church in Houston, Texas. Unfortunately, our community was rocked by a school shooting at nearby Santa Fe High School. A 17-year-old student killed nine of his classmates and a substitute teacher. He also wounded 10 more. In response to this horrific event, our leadership team began to implement more safety protocols like restricting access points to the church offices, more stringent lockup procedures for staff, installation of video cameras around the church grounds, and using buzz-in technology to manage foot traffic at all of our exterior doors. A former police officer turned safety specialist trained our staff on what to do in case of an armed intruder. The all-day training session was pretty intense. With the tragedy of Santa Fe in the forefront of our minds, we watched videos and heard lectures designed to teach us the three techniques to handle the situation of a live shooter. Run, hide, and fight. Run when there is an active threat and call 911 when you reach safety. Hide if escape is not possible. Block the doors, avoid windows, and silence your cell phones. And fight only as a last resort and only if your life is in danger. We were encouraged to begin paying attention to everything and everyone around us. Everyone could be a threat and everyday objects like books, chairs, pencils, pens, scissors, staplers could be weapons used in case of an attack. Now having situational awareness is important in safety training, but seeing everyone as a threat and everything as a weapon raised the stress level, real or perceived, after the terrible tragedy. Thankfully, our church did not experience any real danger in the wake of the shootings, but it changed us. Our scripture passage for today challenges us to be aware of the danger and threats around us, but singles out a very different kind of enemy and arms us with a very different type of weapon. Friends, let's hear from the word of the Lord from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day. And having done everything, to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I must speak. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. On one hand, Paul's words to the Ephesians are comforting, right? Be strong, stand, wear God's armor. <laughs> cool. On the other hand, it's a little alarming. Armor? Cosmic powers? Spiritual forces? Flaming arrows? What? That sounds incredibly dangerous, and I'm not sure I signed up for all that. Well, if you've been with us through this Faith Foundation series, we've learned that the first part of Ephesians lays out the theological underpinnings, the what and the why of the good news of faith in Jesus as God's Son. In the second half of Ephesians, Paul provides believers with practical insight and application regarding what a life of faith in Jesus Christ actually looks like. How we are to put off the old life and put on the new life that is ours in Christ. And here, as Paul calls for unity amongst Jew and Gentile believers, he talks about how our relationship with God, our relationship with, uh, with others, and our view of the world changes through these new lenses of faith. He reminds the Ephesians of the gifts that God has given. He reminds them that they are to have their minds renewed, to think differently than the rest of the folks around them who don't believe, to take on the likeness of God and to be clothed in righteousness and holy living, 
to speak the truth in love, to put away bitterness and wrath, to be kind to one another, to serve one another in love, and to live in peace. And Paul writes that while there is very real evil raging in the world, through our faith in Christ, we are no longer to see human beings as enemies, but as ones who are made in the image of God. Instead of seeing everyone as a threat, as our church safety instructor told us during training, Paul challenges us to see deeper, to see the true enemy, the devil, the adversary, the evil one, the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers of darkness, the spiritual forces of evil. Now, we don't like to talk about this much because there is so much that we don't understand about the things that we can't see. And frankly, with all this talk about spirits and darkness and evil and such, it can be a little scary to know we have an enemy who seeks to lie, steal, kill, and destroy. Over the centuries, many people have taken up and taught beliefs that are less than helpful here and less than biblical. Some overemphasize spiritual warfare, blaming everything that goes wrong in the world on demonic activity or thanking angels for everything good, like finding good parking spaces at the grocery store. On the other hand, some go as far as denying the reality of spiritual forces at all. For some of them, ideas of Satan and demonic powers are relics of pre-scientific age or magical and mythical creature as harmless as a fairy tale. In my view and in my experience, both are incorrect and can lead to danger. But in the context of the letter to the Ephesians, Paul keeps things in perspective. First, Paul provides readers with clarity about who wins. In the first part of his letter, Paul declares that God through Christ has won the victory in the heavenly places far above all, run in authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. At the same time, he recognizes the very real evil in the world and names its source as a real entity. Much of the New Testament encourages believers to prepare for conflict, not necessarily flesh and blood conflict, but conflict on a spiritual level. Despite this, Christians are called again and again to stand firm, a command that is echoed many times. For example, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 6 through 8, in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, 1 Corinthians 16, 13, and again in Romans 13, 11 through 14. With several reminders to stand firm then, it lets readers know the challenges will require resolve. In my research, one commentator, Adam Copeland, pointed out that this passage gives instructions for ways to endure and remain faithful amid the battle. In order for his readers to stand firm, Paul emphasizes that God has mercifully provided armor that can help us endure and remain faithful. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, and the Word of God. Many preachers are eager to point out that all but one of these pieces of equipment are protective gear. They're meant for defense against outside attacks. Those same preachers typically talk a little too eagerly about the one offensive weapon, the sword of the Spirit, as if they envision it being swung about with reckless abandon. One commentary I consulted quoted a Catholic priest named Rudolf Schnackenberg, who said that the soldier in Ephesians is armed to do battle to protect in order to preserve a peace that has already been established not create that peace. I like that. God's Word, the sword of the Spirit, is used in a manner that preserves and keeps and preaches the peace won by Jesus Christ. And part of that's comforting too, right? Keeping the peace is much more pleasant than storming a castle or seeking out warfare. However, it's equally true that having primarily defensive gear means knowing that you're going to get hit, and like a lot. <laughs> Have you ever heard the phrase, God won't give you more than you can handle? I'm sure you have. While it sounds soothing, it's not biblically or theologically sound. It's more like a half-truth. Instead, the whole truth is even better. I love how Eugene Peterson translates Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13-18 through 18 in the message. He says this, Be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get, every weapon God has issued, so that when it's all over, but for the shouting, you'll still be on your feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation are more than words. Learn how to apply them. You'll need them throughout your life. God's Word is an indispensable weapon. In the same way, prayer is essential in the ongoing welfare. Pray hard and long. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirits up so that one so that no one falls behind and no one drops out. 
instead of saying God will not give you more than you can handle, the whole truth is that God will help you handle more than you think or imagine. In summarizing the takeaway for this passage, Charles Aaron Jr. writes this, Praying in the Spirit serves not just for the individual faith development, but as part of the fight that the church must engage against evil that transcends what any individual can combat alone. Truth counteracts the lies and misinformation that exist everywhere. Righteousness builds relationships that sustain and enable the work. The gospel of peace presents a vision of what God wills for creation. Faith keeps at least some energy going in the face of setbacks and defeats. Salvation includes the healing and personal growth that inspires the battle. The Spirit and the Word of God animate and guide the battle against the evil of the world. I think that's pretty well said. Friends, the good news for believers is that we know who ultimately wins the battle. Through Christ, God brings peace and restoration to all things in the heavenly realm and eventually on earth as well. At the same time, we're told time and again in the scriptures to stand firm, to anticipate challenges and fights, not against our brothers and sisters, not even against those who have not yet seen the goodness of God's grace. No, we're told that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We're told time and again, that we have an enemy who wants nothing more than to advance the darkness of evil and to lay siege to the kingdom of God. Truth be told, you and I don't need to look far to see the truth of that statement. We need not look very far to see that there is very real evil in this world. We saw it at that shooting at Santa Fe High School. We see it in systems of oppression. We see it in the way that we demonize and villainize others. We see it in cases of abuse and neglect. We see it in places like Haiti and Afghanistan. We see it in our own political structures. And sometimes, maybe we even see it looking back at us in the mirror. But despite the evil in this world, we are equipped to stand firm against it. The good news is that sin and death have been defeated. We have been made free to put on a new life made possible by Christ We have been given the tools needed to protect our hearts from harm, to keep the peace that has already been won, and to advance the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, a message that shines light into darkness and changes lives from the inside out. And so, my friends, do not be afraid, but stand firm. Stand firm on the foundation of faith that is yours in Christ Jesus. Stand firm knowing that not everyone is a threat and not everything is a weapon. Stand firm on the truth of the gospel, that God has triumphed over evil, that we have been called and claimed as God's own, and that God will help us handle more than we can think or imagine. Friends, may you find rest in that truth today. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Jesus tells us to give with joy. Church, your faithfulness to Christ's commands have a lasting impact in our church, our community, and in our world. I want to thank you for your faithful stewardship and for your willingness to continue partnering God's work here in Morganton and beyond. And so I invite you to give your tithes and offerings using the link at the bottom of your screen or by mailing them to our church office. Thank you for your continued generosity and support. God has shown us the meaning of generosity in the beautiful diversity of creation, in the overflowing love of Jesus Christ, in the never-ending gift of the Holy Spirit. God has abundantly blessed us and called us to be a community that honors each other, serves each other with joy, and shares our love and material possessions. Let us rejoice in what we have been given and in what is ours to give. Let us pray together. Ever-present God, with this offering, we present also ourselves, all that we've been, all that we are, and all that we will become, and our resolve to walk in your way. Accept us and our offering, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, the source of all our gifts. Praise Jesus Christ, whose power of bliss. Praise the Spirit, Holy Spirit. Friends, the people of God have been called to pray for the needs of the world and our community and our congregation. So let's pray together. Eternal God, anxiety constricts and muscles tense as summer wanes and students return to school and the Delta variant looms. What will this year bring? What new challenges will we meet? Can we start again when we have not rested and renewed ourselves like normal? Do we dare get our hopes up in the midst of the continuing unknown? Gracious and patient God, Bear with us in our fear and uncertainty. Calm our pinched nerves with the Spirit's deep breath of peace. Guide and direct us with your wisdom as we pour ourselves out to you in prayer. Hear and receive us, holy God. We come as we are. Great and wonderful God, we praise you for the gifts with which you bless us. Gifts of renewal, gifts of unexpected grace and intentional practice. We thank you for summer travel and early evening breezes and entertainment where our minds can escape, church groups meeting for fellowship and learning and service. Merciful God, strengthen us in prayer that we might lift up the brokenness of this world. You make all things new. And we offer our prayers for its renewal and healing today. Especially we pray for those who remain isolated even as others enjoy new freedom. The newly sick the breakthrough infections, the hospitals and hospital personnel under mounting pressure, the children who can't get vaccinated yet must return to school, the people of the world without access to vaccines, affordable and advanced health care. Oh God, you are the wellspring of life. Pour into our thirsty and anxious souls the living water of your grace that we may be refreshed this day to continue in mission and ministry. May the pressures of this moment not paralyze us, but encourage us to lean into the needs we encounter, to lean on each other, and to lean on you for strength and support. Unite as a family in faith, and as the body of Christ, we lift these prayers up to you, God, our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. And finally, hear us praying the prayer Jesus Christ taught us all to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so my friend, may you stand firm in your faith foundation. 
May you know that the battle is won and that you are protected when you put on the armor of God. And as battles rage on in your life and in mine, and as we confront evil in the world, may we remember that God will help us handle more than we can think or imagine. And so, friend, may the love of God and the abiding grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen.